Welcome to this online lesson asking the question, why did the peasants revolt against the king in 1381? Our aims today are to know the background causes of the peasants' revolt, to describe and explain the events of the revolt, and to evaluate interpretations of the revolt. Firstly, we're going to have a look at some key words. In Cloak's compendium of annoying old-fashioned words you need to know today are poll tax, a type of tax where every person pays the same amount regardless of how wealthy they are. Revolt, where people with less power fight back against more powerful people. Also, a rebellion. And boon work, work that peasants had to do on their lord's land before they could work for themselves. Peasants often work between four and five days on their lord's land, especially at harvest time, compared to one to two days on their own, so it was hard to make ends meet for them. Your tasks then. Firstly, record the definitions for these key words. You can put them in your own words preferably. Then, explain why a poll tax is not actually fair, even though it is an equal payment for all. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. OK, with the issue with the poll tax, it's got to be borne in mind that although it might seem fair that everyone pays the same, not everyone has the equal ability to pay the same. As we will see, the poll tax in 1381 was four pence for every per person who was over 15 years old. That might not sound like a lot, but actually very often a peasant might only earn a penny or so in a week's work. So it really is quite a lot of money. On the other end of the scale, a very rich person, like a lord, Four pence is something that they would hardly notice. So this tax, despite the fact that it's, being e it's equal for everyone, it has a different uh, impact on those people, depending on whether they're poor or rich. Interestingly, this isn't the first time that a poll tax had been introduced in England, but it was many hundreds of years before a similar tax was tried again. In fact, it was reasonably recently. About 30 years ago, in, in 1989, Margaret Thatcher tried to introduce a poll tax. And... Actually, she caused a sort of rebellion herself. She tried to introduce a poll tax to Scotland and people rioted against it. So, she clearly hadn't done her historical studies of the Peasants' Revolt, or if she had, she hadn't learnt the lessons of it. So, let's make sure that you don't fall into the same trap if you ever become Prime Minister, and let's have a look at what caused the Peasants' Revolt, what happened, and also what our interpretations or views of the Peasants' Revolt are. Firstly, we're going to have a look at a little bit of background. It's important to understand the, the, what England was like at the time of the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. So we're going to have a look at an example here. This is the remains of a medieval village. How do we know? Because it was deserted over 400 years ago. What you might be able to make out in the fields are the roads and lanes connecting up all the buildings. The remains of the ploughed fields where the peasants grew their crops and even some of the buried buildings as well, including a church. But what happened to this village? Why did it disappear? There are over 3,000 shrunken and deserted villages in the UK, including some in Devon, such as a place called Houndtor, which is up on Dartmoor. So why did these villages die out? Is it because the Black Death killed most of the people? Is it because the weather got worse and so the farms failed? It was because the landowners sold the land or evicted the farmers. Perhaps the villagers ran out of money and so had to move to where the money was. In fact, almost all of these possibilities are true. But which is the most common reason? If you want to make an educated guess at that, you can pause the video here or you can just wait for the answer. The most common reason that these villages either shrunk or were deserted is because the villagers ran out of money and so had to move to where the money was. However, this might have been contributed to by the other reasons too. The idea that deserted medieval villages were all deserted because of the Black Death killing everyone is for the most part not true. Just as an aside, here's a picture of another village called Warren Percy. This one's up in Yorkshire. This is how it looked in its heyday. And this is how it looks today. The church remained in use for the local farming community long after the village actually disappeared. But you can just about make out where some of the roads and buildings were. Similarly, here's Hound Tor, which I mentioned before. You can see the village's longhouses and the main road going through the middle and a surrounding wall. 
In fact, we think that Hound Tor almost certainly was a rare example of a village that died out because of the Black Death directly. And another view of the villagers' houses here. What we're going to find out, though, is that these long houses were long for a reason. At one end you were to keep your animals, and at the other end you would live. It would be a very tough existence, trying to eke out a living and grow enough uh, food to eat. So peasants had a really hard life already. And that helps explain why they began to revolt. When life was hard, they, just, they got angry. And when they got angry, they decided to fight back and try and get a better deal. In the period after the Black Death, there were economic winners and losers. The key word here is the economy. This means anything relating to money, buying and selling, and also people's work. There's no doubt that the Black Death was a huge disaster, but in the long term, some people lost more and some people gained more from it. The feudal system can help demonstrate this, and this might be something that you've studied before. First of all, copy down this feudal system triangle. It doesn't need to be mega neat, just make sure that you've got the idea that the king is at the top with the most power, then the nobles are underneath him with lots of land and lots of power. The knights have slightly less land and quite a bit less power, and they own knight service or military service, and then we've got the peasants right down at the bottom. And the peasants made up the vast majority of the country's population. Secondly, which groups would you expect to suffer most in the Black Death? And which group would you expect to gain most from the Black Death? Pause the video here while you complete that diagram and give those second and third questions a brief answer. So what did we think? Perhaps you'd expect the king and the nobles to benefit most from the Black Death and the peasants to lose out most. Often in disasters, it's the poorest in society that tend to be able to weather at least well. But actually, given that the peasants made up the majority of the country at this time, that wasn't the whole picture at all. On this screen, I'm going to show you a series of consequences of the Black Death. In other words, things that happened as a result. Your task will be to identify which group of the feudal system each fact relates to. Is it the king? Is it the nobles? Is it the knights or is it the peasants? You'll then need to explain how each fact made the group winners or losers from the Black Death. Let's have a look at the first one, and we'll do this one together. Because so many poor workers died, surviving workers could demand better pay. All right, let's think, first of all, who was doing most of the work. Okay, so that one relates to the peasants. Does that make them winners or losers? Well, if they survived, and now they're getting better pay, I think we can consider them winners. So for that one there, I just uh, note down number one, peasants, winners. And then if you have a chance to, you can just note down they got better pay. Right, let's try the second one together, and then the rest are down to you. Two, nobles found that their wealth could, did not protect them. Some noble families died or lost all of their wealth. Right, pretty obviously that one there is to do with the nobles, and they are losers in this circumstance. Because they lost a huge number of people, just like the poor people did, noble families that relied on passing their belongings from one generation to the next would sometimes die out altogether. The rest you can try on your own. You can pause them one at a time as we go through, or you can wait till I've read them all and do them all at once at the end. Three, poor farmers had more freedom to move when the, their villagers died out. They could find better work. Four, even the King of England, Edward III, lost his favourite daughter, Princess Joan, to the Black Death. Five, the movement of knights and soldiers on campaign helped to spread the plague and made, made them more likely to catch it. Six, the poor were less likely to trust the rich and do what they were told. This gave them more rights in the long term. Seven, rich nobles who traded in goods in Europe found that they couldn't trade as much. And lastly, eight, the church had an important role in helping the sick, but this meant that the nobility and the clergy were especially high, hardly hit. Okay, pause the video if you're going to complete that task. Don't spend too long on it, and then we'll move on. Hopefully what you've recognised here is it's actually the upper regions of society, the king, the nobles and the knights, who on average have lost out more from the Black Death. And that means that for a time the peasants were feeling a little bit more equal and a little bit less mistreated than they had been before. Unfortunately for them, the nobility and the king wanted to get that power back. And so things were about to get harsher for them. And that, again, helps to explain uh, why they revolted. They'd had a taste of how life could be better, 
and now things were going back to the bad old days. But why were the peasants unhappy in 1381? We're going to produce a mind map or fact file showing the main reasons why the peasants were unhappy. It should have the following sections, and this will give you an idea as to how you could lay out a mind map if that's the way you want to do it. Notice too that I've used colour coding here to make it even clearer. I suggest that you do the same if you are able to do so. Section number one is going to be on work. Section number two is going to be on living conditions. And then the final section is going to be on rules and laws. Pause the video here while you complete the template for your mind map or fact file and then press play when you're ready to see the information. Because all the information that you'll need, you'll be able to get from this video. OK, let's have a look at the first section. Section number one, work. Almost all medieval peasants worked in agriculture, by which I mean farming. Growing enough food for everyone was a priority. However, it was a hard life. Both men and women did hard physical work for as long as the daylight allowed. Fields needed to be ploughed. Produce needed to be carried. All produce needed processing in some way. Wheat needed grinding. Milk needed to be made into cheese and butter, etc. Peasants ate little but worked hard. They were almost always hungry. Women also had to work in the home. Cleaning, cooking, childcare, spinning wool and weaving cloth, and also making beer, which was safer to drink back then than water was, and also provided much needed extra calories. Peasants had to do what was known as boon work and week work, and this was on their lord's land. They had to do this before working on their own. Often this work would make it impossible to make much money off the land that they owned or rented. Lords would insist on peasants paying them to grind their corn at the lord's mill and peasants had to give 10% of what they produced to the church as a tithe. Uh, the word tithe itself sort of means tenth, and every year when the harvest was brought in, they could guarantee that 10% of that would be given to the church, almost like a tax. It was supposedly going to be, be helping the priests and supporting the church itself, who were engaged in the business of religion rather than farming the fields for themselves. But for most people, it just made life harder. So here's how you can record the facts on your mind map. Update your mind map or fact file file now. Include as many examples as you can, and ensure that you include at least two examples of what women did. They made up half the population, so let's make sure that they are well represented in your notes. Explain how this was unfair, and how this made peasants angry. And finally, if you have time, you can illustrate your mind map with a few basic pictures to help show what you mean, and to help make it more memorable. OK, pause the video here. You'll want to spend 10 to 15 minutes doing that. OK, hopefully you've got your section on work complete. Let's have a look at our next one on living conditions. Not all peasants had the same conditions. Free men and women. These peasants were supposed to be free and to own or rent their land. But in reality, they still had to do boon work and pay to use the Lord's mills and ovens to make their bread. Um, at this time, bread was the, what we call the staple diet. It's what absolutely everybody ate, and it's where they got the majority of their calories. Villains. This doesn't mean baddies, by the way. It means people who live in a village. These peasants were unfree. They not only did weak work on the Lord's work, uh, on the Lord's land, rather, but they had to pay rents and get permission for all sorts of things. Who their daughters married, moving to a new village, even leaving their possessions to their children when they died. All of those things required the permission of the Lord, and the Lord was well within his rights to disagree. Most peasants lived in basic longhouses. We saw some of these earlier at, at Hound Tor, but to get an idea of what they looked like when they were in use, have a look at the picture to the top right. These usually had basic living space at one end, and often you would sleep up in the rafters. And at the other end, that was used for the animals. Women worked hard to keep these homes as comfortable as they could, but they were cold in winter and smelly all year round. They envied the rich in their manor houses. Peasants often suffered the worst from outbreaks of disease because they were often weak from hunger and lived in unavoidably dirty conditions. Right, let's update our mind map again. Again, include as many examples as you can, and ensure you include at least two examples affecting the women again. Explain how this was difficult and how this made the peasants angry. Again, you can illustrate your map if you want to. About 10 to 15 minutes on this section. Off you go. Pause the video now.
Let's move on to our last section on rules and laws. Peasants already had lots of rules and they had to follow you know, them about their working lives. But that wasn't all. For example, we've looked at boon work and wheat work and also having to get the permission of their lords. In 1377, 1379 and in 1381, King Richard II, advised by his council, he was a very young king by the way, we'll look at that later, introduced heavy poll taxes. These were taxes where everyone paid the same regardless of their wealth. The taxes paid for wars. Everyone over 15 had to pay four pence, a lot of money for the poor, although of course not much money for the wealthy. The king sent out aggressive enforcers to collect the money and make sure that everyone paid up. War also affected the poor. Men might be forced to join the, their lord in the army where they had a high chance of dying of hunger or disease, even without having to contend with a battle. Peasants had briefly enjoyed better rules and pay as a result of labour shortages during the Black Death, but life soon got worse again. Laws were harsh, and so were the punishments. Whole villages might be fined when a criminal wasn't captured, and peasants could be whipped, put in the stocks, or even have their hand cut off for committing a crime. The sheriffs and local laws decided who was guilty, so the rich often got away with crimes. Where this couldn't be decided, it was left to God with a trial by ordeal or a trial by battle. A medieval representation at the top right here shows these two different features. A bit of explanation. These tended to favour the rich, and here's how it worked. If you couldn't prove your innocence, then you could request a trial by ordeal. There are various forms of this, but it usually involves some sort of painful wound. Either, as here, you would be forced to plunge your hand into the bottom of a boiling bucket of water and grasp a stone from the bottom of it. Your blistered and wounded hand would then be wrapped up, and in a week or two they would check on it, and if it was healing quite nicely, then it was judged that God thought that you were innocent and you'd be set free. If it wasn't healing and it was all infected, it was judged that God thought you were guilty and you'd be dealt with. Another version of this involved holding a red-hot iron and having to walk seven paces. Again, that would blister and burn, and how well you healed from it would decide your guilt or otherwise. Trial by battle was a favourite of the nobility, though. They were often skilled and well-equipped warriors. If they were rich enough, they could demand that a weaker person could uh, meet them as a trial by battle, and the idea would be that whoever won the battle, God thought was innocent. Actually, in reality, it just meant that that person was a better fighter and stronger. The rich could even hire a, a champion to fight on their behalf if they were too old. So hopefully we can see how these rules and laws tended to favour the rich and keep the poor uh, struggling. So update your mind map now, include as many examples as you can, and you must, absolutely must, include details about the poll tax. Most people agree that this is the big reason behind the peasants' revolt. Also explain how these rules were unfair and how this made the peasants angry, and again, you can illustrate your mind map if you have time. Another 10 to 15 minutes on that, off you go. Pause the video now. Okay, so now we're setting the scene for why the peasants are so angry at this time, and that'll help explain why it all kicks off in the Peasants' Revolt. Now we're going to create a narrative account of the events of the Peasants' Revolt. This is where you tell the story of what happened, but on top of this, you have to explain events and link them together. This is an important skill, as it shows that you have knowledge of what happened and understanding of why things happened. Let's kick it off by looking at our first round of facts. Part 1 in Essex and Kent. The peasants had finally had enough of all their hardship, and the most recent 1381 poll tax tipped the peasants in both Kent and Essex into revolt. In Brampton in Essex, the peasants refused to pay the tax and tried to kill Thomas Brampton, the, the tax collector. In Kent, the king's tax collector was turned away on May the 30th, and in the days after, large numbers of peasants gathered in Dartford, Maidstone and Rochester. The Kent rebels then travelled to Canterbury, where they killed three of the king's men. Then, led by a man called Watt Tyler, who was an ordinary labourer, probably someone who made tiles, because that was one of the local industries, uh, they headed for London to confront the king and his advisers. So we're going to complete part one of our narrative account now. Remember, this is where we tell the story, but we've got to explain what's going on. So write the first stage of your narrative account. In it, you'll need to describe where the events happened, who was involved, Describe what they did in the order that they did it, and also explain why what happened actually occurred. What was the cause behind it? Some key vocab to help you out. 
is you start your sentence by saying firstly or at first, something of that uh, kind of type. This led to, consequently, as a result of this, and this meant, are other good sentence starters to move your story forward. Remember, you are not bullet pointing what happened. You are telling the story in a full paragraph so we get an idea as to what really happened as a story. All right, that will require a little bit of, uh, of writing and it'll take you between probably five to ten minutes to write that up, maybe a little bit longer depending on how slowly you write. Pause the video here and use the information to help you. In London. In mid-June, the peasants arrived in London and numbered around 60,000 people. This was a huge number for the time. King Richard II, aged only 14, was in deep danger. A poor priest by the name of John Ball gave a sermon to the rebel pe peasants, and this whipped them up into a fury. The rich have wines, spices and fine bread, while we have only rye and water. It is by our labour that they live so well. We are called slaves, and if we do not perform our services, we are beaten. Let us go to the king. He is young, and from him we may receive a favourable answer. This is the thing. They realised that the king was young, and he might be easier to push around. But also, a lot of the peasants felt that the king, being so young, was being pushed around by his own advisers, and so that they felt that they were probably doing him a favour by pointing it out. The peasants went on the rampage through London. They burned down the manor of the Duke of Lancaster. The king sent out messengers. The peasants told them that they were there to rescue the king from his evil advisers. The king wanted to meet the peasants, but fearing for his life, the king decided not to meet them. Wat Tyler and his rebels invaded the Tower of London and cut off the head of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon Sudbury, who the peasants blamed for some of their troubles. Uh, just as an aside, you can actually visit Simon Sudbury's head, which is kept in the church where he originally came from in Sudbury. Pretty gross. OK, then, write the, for the next stage of your narrative account. In it, again, you'll need to describe where the events happened, what happened, why the events happened, and remember to include a quote from John Ball and use some quote marks to make sure that it's clear that you are using a quote. Oh, also, I will point out that King Richard agreed to meet the rebels at Smithfield on June the 15th, and that will be our next stage. Remember the key vocab. This can help you connect together your story and make sure that it makes sense. All right, there's loads of info on the screen there, so pause it, and you might benefit from watching this in full screen and being able to read it more easily, therefore, if you haven't done so that already. So pause the video and complete the next stage of your narrative. OK, so we've seen how the peasants in Kent and Essex gathered. Now how we've, seen, we've seen how they uh, rampaged through London, and now we're going to see how the story ends. At Smithfield. On June the 15th, 1381, King Richard II met the peasants at Smithfield. What happened next is open to debate, debate but what we know is this. Wat Tyler rode over to the king and made his demands. The king appeared to have agreed to some, but not all the demands. A scuffle broke out and the mayor of London drew his sword and killed Wat Tyler. This was a dangerous moment and the peasant army were ready to fight, but the young king had other ideas. Richard rode over to the peasants. He told them that he heard their demands, but they should go home. He said something along the lines of, villains you were, and villains you remain. This is how some historians have recorded his words. After the revolt, the peasants were even worse off, but within 20 years or so, most of their demands for a fairer life had come true under a new king. So again, Write your next stage of the narrative account. In it, you'll need to describe where the events happened, what happened, why the events happened, and again, if you're going to use a quote like villains you were, villains you remain, make sure you use some quote marks. Your key vocab again is down there in case you need a reminder. So for the last time in the narrative account, pause the video and complete your next section. problems that historians have with events that happened so long ago is that multiple interpretations or opinions about what happened exist. Very often the documents that can tell us about what happened are pretty sparse and so we have to go on the best information available and make some educated guesses and judgments as to what is most likely. This painting was painted about 60 years after the events. It's clearly inaccurate in some ways, not just uh, the way that it shows events but also the way it portrays the people. 
In the top right hand corner you can see the peasant army. They're all in plate army, armour that only the most well equipped and rich soldiers would, would own. But again, this is the artist kind of telling us that this is an army ready for battle. Here are the really key details though. Firstly, this young fellow here is King Richard wearing the crown. He's speaking to somebody, probably Wat Tyler. He's holding out his hand, which is usually indicative of someone speaking. This person, in a much more poor costume, is Wat Tyler himself. Notice that he's shown drawing his sword. It's unlikely he would have owned a sword that was quite that posh, but there he is being shown drawing it. This is the Mayor of London, with his sword ready to hack at him. Confusingly, some medieval paintings actually show the same character twice, a little bit like how a cartoon st uh, strip tells a story with multiple pictures of the same person. However, unlike a modern cartoon strip, which will separate it up into different frames to make uh, the meaning clear, the king is actually shown a second time here, discussing with the rebels and sending them home. We're going to have a look at two interpretations of the, these events now, and you'll be able to make your mind up as to which one you think is more likely. Let's have a look at interpretation one. You'll notice that both of these interpretations have their own particular slant or bias towards one side or the other. If you haven't already got your video full screen, I'd recommend that you do this now so that you have the best chance of being able to read this text when you need to. Interpretation one. Peasants betrayed. London, 15th of June, 1381. Today, King Richard proved what a coward and trickster he is. Hiding behind bodyguards, Richard played his treacherous part in the bloody murder of Wat Tyler. Tyler agreed to a meeting because he believed that the king was going to help put right the evils which made life a misery for ordinary people. In good faith, Wat rode to, across to speak with the king, but was immediately surrounded by soldiers. Out of sight of the peasants, the bloodthirsty mayor of London hacked down Tyler as he spat out some of the drink that he'd been given. The king rode up to the peasants. He told them to follow him and he would see that they got home safely. But they soon found themselves surrounded by soldiers. Which side does that one particularly seem to favour? Let's have a look at interpretation two. Same event, just a different slant. Interpretation two. Brave king beats rebels. London, the 15th of June, 1381. Today saw great celebrations after brave 14-year-old King Richard led his men to a brilliant victory over the peasant rebels who had brought death and destruction to the city. With courage and majesty, the king rode to Smithfield with his trusted followers to meet an army of 20,000 angry rebels. Tyler advanced to the king, dagger in hand, and spat at him. He then stabbed the mayor of London in the stomach. The mayor bravely struck back with his sword, and Tyler fell to the ground screaming for revenge. King Richard calmly strode forward to the peasants and ordered them to obey him. Surprised, they surrendered. The king then let them go home safely. Let's see what you think of that. Task 1. A. Which interpretation sides with the peasants? Add a quote that shows this and remember your quote marks for that. B. Now give a quote from the other interpretation that, it shows, that shows that it sides with the king. 2. Give a few ways in which the accounts are similar to each other and how they differ. And thirdly, finish off your narrative account by describing events for yourself. You should aim to include features from both of these interpretations so that yours is balanced somewhere in the middle, not being biased towards either side. OK, pause the video here and complete that task. All right, let's have a think. Interpretation 1 clearly favours the peasants, and interpretation 2 the king. Hopefully you've selected appropriate quotes that show this. They are similar in some ways though. In both of them, the king rides up to the peasants and demands to speak to them. Also this is done after Wat Tyler is killed. Wat Tyler also spits and drink in both of them, but it's not quite clear the reasons why he did this, and both of them give a different slant to this. And in both of them, the Mayor of London is the one that kills Wat Tyler. Also, we might note too that in both of them, the peasants do end up going home. And effectively, they've lost. Or have they? Finally, Wat Tyler was killed by the Mayor of London at the end of the revolt. There he is. And the King did lie about helping the peasants. He made their conditions harder. 
The king told the peasants, villains you were and villains you remain. The peasants then went home without changing the king's mind. But within 20 years, the peasants had got rid of the poll tax and had got the freedoms in Magna Carta, but originally had only applied to rich people. Let's not forget, though, that Magna Carta was sealed in 1215, so we've had to wait a good 200 years in order to get there. The question is then, did the peasants win the revolt? Well, rather than answering that now, we're going to have a look at two more interpretations and you decide which one you agree with. Interpretation one. I think the peasants did not win the peasants' revolt. An example that shows this is that Wat Tyler was killed and Richard II did not help the peasants. This proves that the peasants did not win because their lives did not change and they did not get what they wanted. OK, there's nothing inaccurate about that. That's all factually true. But do you agree with it? Interpretation two. I think the peasants did win the peasants' revolt. An example that shows this is that within 20 to 40 years, the peasants got what they wanted. This proves that the peasants won because their lives did change eventually and the revolt was an important stage in causing that change. Again, factually, there's nothing inaccurate there. That is accurate. So neither of these has actually told any lies and neither of these has actually used any false facts. But they are looking at the events in a slightly different way. Your final task then. Which interpretation do you most agree with? Explain why with at least one example from today's lesson. Write down your answer, and once you've done that, that will be the end of the lesson. I hope you found it useful and interesting, and if you have, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. So, finish that last task, and once you have, I'll say goodbye.